Good morning and shalom, everyone. Welcome to Acts Reformed Church here in West Covina. Uh, we are beginning the Sunday School class, which we aim to start at 9.45 a.m. And I live stream that on the Theology Zone Facebook page, which will later be uploaded to the Theology Zone YouTube channel. Our corporate worship here at Acts Reformed Church begins at 10.30 a.m., which we live stream on the Facebook page, Acts Reformed Church, A-C-T-S Reformed Church. Uh, and then it will later be uploaded to the YouTube channel, also called Acts Reformed Church, A-C-T-S Reformed Church. If you're watching this online and you would like to join us and meet our, our, any of our clergy, uh, Elder Gerardo or Deacon Ron, you can meet us here at 3528 East Temple Way, West Covina, California. Uh, so we begin the Sunday school class with the Sunday school prayer. Unfortunately, we don't have it on the screen, but I hope everyone can remember it because we do it every Sunday. And I think it's, it's an important thing to remember because the Shema of Israel is basically our pledge of allegiance and our commitment, our covenantal commitment to the one God who is Yahweh. So the Sunday school prayer, if we can say it together, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Echad, which is in Hebrew. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Now, uh, last week when I talked, because we, we're winding down to the last two attributes on the list that I have anyway. And uh, we were doing God is omnipotent. The next attribute that we're going to do will be God is sovereign. When we get to God is sovereign, we're going to get into the good, the bad, and the ugly because the, uh, the sovereignty of God gets into the ugly side of everything that happens in the world. And uh, in a lot of ways, it, it, the doctrine of the sovereignty of God is actually very offensive to the sensitivity of modern man, especially with a postmodern self-esteem mindset where people don't want to be offended. They want to feel good about themselves, and they want God to accept man as he is. So we talked about, uh, I'm not going to repeat the quotes that I gave last week, but I just wanted to just as a summary, we were basically saying that God, because he's the creator of all things, he is all powerful, and there is nothing that is beyond his abilities. I made the analogies to Iron Man, who has these Iron Man suits who can get, that can get drained of their power. I talked about Superman, who ha whose body is charged up by the yellow sun. But if you drain Superman of those powers, he is just a mortal man and he can even die. God does, cannot be drained of his powers. God is actually eternally and consistently almighty. He is never going to be more powerful than he is now. He's never going to be weaker than he is now. He wasn't less powerful yesterday. God is. But one of the things that we talked about is that the the infinite power of God, when we're looking at the fact that God is omnipotent or all-powerful or almighty, or the other ways of saying it, we must understand the almighty nature of God's abilities, his powers, as not to isolate that attribute from the other attributes, such as God is holy, God is loving, God is righteous, God is merciful. God may be all-powerful, but he's also all-good, he's also just so he can't, he can't go against his own nature. So we, we talked about how uh, God, there are certain things that God cannot do. So we talked, for example, about the nature of evil in the world. We talk about how can God make a rock that's so big that even he can't lift it. Well, by definition, because God is infinite and God cannot be drained of his powers, he can't do that. So God cannot, he cannot create something that is too heavy for him uh, by definition. But that's not a limitation on God in terms of vastness. It's a limitation upon God that is by his own very nature. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ontological limitation. It's, it's a limitation that is grounded in his own nature. So God, if it goes against his nature, he cannot do it. So let's look at a, a couple of things that are impossible for God to do. Uh, things that are impossible for God. God cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.13 If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Now any of us can deny ourselves. You, in, any one of us can make the mistake of, of losing faith in ourselves, 
we are capable of, uh, of even denying who we are. You know, some people always say, are you so-and-so? No, who's asking? Right? That that's happens, right? We see it on TV. We see it in movies. We see it in stories. We may have seen even someone that we know deny that they are who they are. God can't do that. God fears no one. So we must understand that his attributes must be interpreted in relationship to one another. So when you look at uh, certain people, especially like tele-evangelists, uh, one of the guys that comes up to my, my, my mind, of course, is Joel Osteen, who's always having a very sugar-coated, uh, honey-flavored uh, message that comes from his lips and uh, is on the television screens about how God wants to do these wonderful things for you. And, and the God that he has, uh, the God that he preaches, though I'm not, I'm not going to say that he denies that God has wrath, but he definitely does not emphasize the wrath of God the, as much as he does the love of God. He doesn't emphasize the justice and righteousness and holiness of God the way that he emphasizes his grace and mercy. Now, I'm not, now when we're looking at the attributes of God, and this is extremely important that we understand the attributes of God, because the gospel presentation, when we're speaking to a lost world, if we're speaking to the unbeliever and we're trying to reach them with the gospel, which Paul says is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1.16, it is understood to be good news, which is what the word gospel means. It is understood to be good news because the good news is good news because of the bad news. Remember that the bad news is that we're sinners, that God is holy, he's, a, he's, he's holy, he is sovereign, he is just, he is righteous, he is all of those things, and because of all of those things, we are justly condemned and deserving of his wrath. That is from the attributes of God. But... God is also gracious and merciful. So because God is also gracious and merciful, that's where the gospel comes in. So the condemnation comes from the attribute of righteousness and justice, but the gospel comes from the attributes of grace and mercy, which we've covered in, in, this, in this series. So we must understand that if we have a faulty view of the attributes of God, it will affect how we understand and we preach the gospel. So it's extremely important. There is no gospel without the attributes of God properly understood. The second thing is God can't lie. I remember years ago I was talking to an uncle of mine and he says to me, you know, but God can't lie because, you know, he just chooses not to. It's not that he can't, it's that he chooses not to. And I said, no, it means that he can't. The, why do people lie? People lie because they feel the need to conceal the truth. Men may lie to, their, to wives or, or women for one set of reasons, and women may lie to men for a different set of reasons. Both are still wrong. But, man, but God has no fear of telling the truth. There is no one to hold him accountable. There is no psychological need that God needs to say, man, I better not tell the truth here. Now, God can conceal the truth, but, but concealing the truth is not the same as lying. But for man, when man lies, his, his motivation is to conceal the truth, to omit the truth, or to distort the truth. So the passage here is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 19. In the same way, God desiring even more to show the, to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, guaranteed it, 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 I'm sorry, guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and confirmed and one which enters within the veil. So here we see that God, because he is truth, remember that one of the attributes that we said is that God is truth. Now, in our postmodern era that we live, postmodernism means whatever you believe or whatever your perception is of the world around you, they'll say, well, that's your truth. That's not what the word truth means in the Bible. In other words, this postmodern Michel Foucault uh, Jacques Derrida type of idea of postmodern 
ism and, and the idea that when we look at words, we can interpret them in a modern context and ignore what the author meant. In fact, postmodernism was actually known as the death of the author. What we understand from it, and I actually had come up with a definition of truth which I liked, and I actually, I, I actually asked a Christian philosopher that I'm friends with on Facebook, I said, do you think this is a fitting definition of truth? He said, yes, my definition was that truth is the verbal description of reality. In other words, if what you say, if what comes out of your mouth or what you type or write or whatever like that does not conform with the reality around you, then it isn't true. And it doesn't matter if you believe it. Truth does not require our belief. If none of us were here, if we could snap our fingers and all of the human race would be gone, the truth would still be the truth. It does not require people to believe it in order to be true. So when we look at this fact, when the Bible says that God is truth, or the, or the Bible describes things as uh, all truth, the truth being God's truth, why is, why is all truth God's truth? Well, because if truth is the verbal description of reality, well, what is reality? Well, there is the reality of creation itself. Well, who created creation? Well, we covered it in the attributes of God. It's in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, if God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and God is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, then who does truth belong to? It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to any of you. It be all truth belongs to God, so therefore all truth is God's truth. So if truth is definitional to the very nature of God, that means that God cannot lie by definition. So God is almighty. Question one, this is from the, this won't be in the notes, I'm sorry I added that. Uh, question one, this is from the uh, catechism that we had used in the Sunday schools previously. Who is the first and greatest of all beings? Answer, God is the first and the greatest of all beings. Scriptures, uh, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 44, 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God beside me. Uh, the second one is Psalm 8, 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name on all the earth, who, has who have displayed your splendor above the heavens, Psalm 8, 1. And then uh, the last one is Psalm 97, verse 9. For you are the Lord most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. So now, we notice the word gods is in plural here. Now, how do we understand that given the fact that we believe that there is only one God? In fact, we began the Sunday school by, by repeating the Sunday school prayer, the Shema. Hero Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Well, in this passage, it says that God is above all, all the other gods. Well, because the word God can refer to entities that are not the, the sovereign, the, the omnipotent one. In other words, there are other entities or spirit beings that you can use the term God for, but they are not the almighty God. So we believe in one God in the sense as a God that is almighty, all-powerful, omnipresent, all-loving, holy. There's only one of those. There's only one kind. But when it comes to objects of worship or spirit beings, there are many of those, and they can be properly referred to as Elohim or gods. Does anyone have any comments or questions before we continue? Yes, brother. Let's just wait for the microphone. Just that in Genesis 1, it says God created everything. And so, in effect, God created truth. Yes. Now, there, there's an interesting point about that because when I covered the, the attribute God is truth, I, what I described is that truth is the verbal description of reality. However, there are two categorical realities. In other words, there is the created reality, which is the creation of the heavens and the earth, which includes us. But then there's the reality of God himself, which is uncreated. So you have these two categories of truth. God is truth. And so he, that, the truth of God is not created because God is eternal. But the truth of creation, which is a, a second reality, is the truth that is created. Uh, so Genesis, did you have a follow-up or does anyone know? Okay. Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too difficult for Yahweh at the appointed time? I will return to you at this time next year and Sarah will have a son. 
Here's an interesting point. Sarah was beyond her years when, it, when God came to visit uh, Abraham and Sarah about having a son. I mean, we, we all know that there are biological situations where women can have children up until a certain age and up until certain biological things take place there is no longer a possibility of a woman giving birth to a child. But in this situation, she was way past that point, and God is still telling Abraham, she will bear you a son. Now imagine that being told to you, and your wife was going to have a son way after the time that she was physically capable of doing so. And that's how powerful God is. And that's when we look at things like the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. There are there are people that will say that, that the virgin birth is so silly. Why would we believe that a woman would give birth to a child being a virgin? The answer is because God is that powerful. Uh, you have this question? If God cre since God creates everything, why did he create sin? Oh, he, he didn't create sin. And that's one of the questions that came up last week, at least in, in a tangential form. The idea is that God is good, and so the idea of sin is that sin is an action. It's not, it's not an impersonal, invisible force that exists. I, one of the analogies that I like to use is the analogy of, of Star Wars, where they have the force. They have the light side of the force and the dark side of the force, and, and they talk about how... It, it don't let the dark side overcome you. We can be overcome by temptation because we are, uh, we are, we are, we gravitate towards the desire to sin because of our sinful nature, because of the fallen Adam. But sin is not an abstract force or an abstract impersonal force. Just like goodness is not an abstract, invisible, impersonal force. All goodness comes from God. So goodness is God, in a sense. So whenever you do good, you're doing, you're doing something that reflects the image of God in you. And so there was, a, there was a definition of evil that was given by Augustine, and I know it's disputed, but there might be some truth to it. And he would say that evil is much like darkness. See, darkness in and of itself doesn't exist because God is the light. God creates the light. And so when you look at a shadow, the sh a sh a shadows don't, shadows basically are something blocking light. And so in a lot of ways, when you look at sin, sin is obstructing God's law. So if you look at God's goodness and righteous law as a light, sin is what just basically blocks it and creates a shadow on basically on our souls in a very real sense. But, but I, I'm not sure, I don't know if it's a good enough answer for you, but the idea is that sin is not some eternal, impersonal, invisible force that exists or something that was created by, by God or something like that, but rather it's an action that takes place in time. And so the first person that we understand to have done something evil would have been Satan himself when he rebelled. But it wasn't because Satan was just around, just going, <laughs> playing his little harp. I'm being satirical there. And then all of a sudden, the dark side came over him, and he became Satan because he's like Darth Vader or something like that. I don't know if that answers your question. but, but it's, So it's not created in the sense of an impersonal force. So you said that the two, so how is it something Well, because God, God decreed that people would have the ability to do something bad. In other words, he gave, them, he gave them the ability to choose not to do something, to, do, to choose to rebel. So he gave them the right. I'm sorry? So I have a question. I think uh, I, I, I sorry. heard that say that I had that question. Yeah. It, oh. If um, everything's created by God, mm -hmm. how can in that bubble to say be sin? So it's like how could sin come out of something so perfect? Mm -hmm. Get me? So I think... Um, I guess this is what also be my question. When God created uh, Adam, um, he basically made him into a mature in at a certain uh, um, way of certain knowledge to say, um, but still capable of sinning, right? Yeah. Because he was in, well, can we say he was made perfect? Yeah, he was in the image of God. But still capable to sin. Yes, that, that's called the passe Um mm -hmm. 
so yeah i guess i would say uh i i still have yet to uh kind of understand even his mm -hmm. question like oh there was iniquity found in him mm -hmm. so it's like how was there in not in adam but mm -hmm. i think it was um satan right that mm -hmm. that's where the verse refers to so how can there be something found in someone that was not created with mm -hmm. well because the, because the question that you're asking presupposes that evil is an impersonal force. And that, that goes back to more of a philosophy of dualism, which I think is found in Zoroastrianism. And the, in the, for, from the biblical perspective, if you're putting yourself, and I'll get to you in a moment, brother, uh, if you think of this within the categories of the biblical writers, not with pagan philosophy and Zoroastrianism, but, but in, within the Judeo context, they don't think along those terms. All they think of is God is the creator and he creates man with the passe pacarum. But he clearly created the angels with the ability to sin. In other words, they didn't have to sin. They had the capacity. Now, yeah. God doesn't have the capacity to sin because God is holy and all of those things. But they do have the capacity to sin. And so when they sin, they, the darkness is find, found in them. And so they're able to do those things. But like I said, if you're thinking about evil with, as, as, a, as an impersonal created force or eternal force, you're not thinking in biblical categories. That, that was not an idea that was among the Jews. So the whole of, um, Mm -hmm. Right. So when God, when God, before the creation in Genesis one one, God was alone. Yeah. So there was no darkness. Mm -hmm. But when God creates the material, Genesis one one, mm -hmm. He says that He separated the light from the darkness. That now we're talking about because there was only righteousness, but then He created the universe, and He created the universe with the capacity, where humanity and the angels with the capacity of committing a sin. So I would say that, that sin and evil are the byproduct of creation, but not, it's not, like I said, a, a, an impersonal force. But I think uh, Brother Allen has a comment. Sure. Uh, Johnny, would it be fair to say that sin is a verb, an action versus a noun, and that sin is more of an attribute of man? Well, it's also of the demons. Uh, uh, the fallen angels, but yeah, the the whole the word the word sin means uh, transgression of law. That's that's so. So it's an means, action, not necessarily a yeah. created being and what. We not to we tend to personify things sin, and there are places in in the Paul, for example, where he speaks of sin and the nature of sin and things like that. But yeah, in in a very technical sense, sin is a verb. It's something that that is done. It's an action. It's not. It's like I said. It's not a personal impersonal force. So from my understanding as Calvinists, we believe that we have no doings, no actions in our salvation. However, the Lord lets us have doings and actions and sin, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so... Well, we're still slaves of sin, so that right. depends on what you're saying. So we have like, I don't want to say free will, but we have a, a more free like will in mm -hmm. sin, mm -hmm. but we have nothing to do with our salvation, right? Mm -hmm. okay, because well, God is sovereign. Yeah. So I'm going to be covering this when I get into total depravity because okay. I'm going to start to, as soon as I'm finished with the, this series, I'm going to start on that. But just to briefly address that, the subject of the will, when you say the word will, the word will means the ability to make choices. That's right. what the word will means. You, you see two choices. And that's why I used the example the last time I was talking about how if you were to ask me, Johnny, would you like to have McDonald's or In-N-Out Burger? Okay, that's a choice. That's I have a will and I have a choice. But which is the one that I would desire more? I know a lot of people are, and I worked for In-N-Out Burger for five years. Okay, I worked for them for five years. They have good burgers. But nine times out of ten, I will choose McDonald's because I prefer the flavor of their beef patties. And, and so, so my will may, be, uh, may have the option, but when, when you define the freedom the freedom will be limited to what I crave. So when you're looking at the human condition, if, you're, if you look at the human condition and you look at man in his depraved mind, you have to remember, when God freed the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery, they were out in the wilderness. And when Moses went up to the mountain, they had seen the miracles. 
They saw the, the plagues. They saw the manna come down from heaven. They saw all these miracles, you know, when they crossed the Red Sea. You know, that must have been an amazing, just to look at the water and to see the fishes and the whatever was there. And they crossed the Red Sea, and guess what? Some of them still didn't believe. So man has a, a, a gra they gravitate towards rebellion against God. That's the problem. Yes, because God, man doesn't deserve, if God decided to send everyone to eternal damnation, he would have every right to do so. He, he has no moral obligation to save anyone. He does that out of his free choice. Uh, brother? Oh, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just yeah. um, in regards to the whole free will thing, um, wouldn't it be because as sinners, every choice that we make out of our flesh would always be sin? So yes. if we're making a decision based on our own free will. We're gonna, we're gonna choose sin. We're gonna choose to reject God, and this is why God. It's by God's sovereignty that He chooses us. Amen. Right. So there are layers to that because remember, when you add the word free to a word like will, that's a prefix. You're adding. So now you're saying, okay, we have a will, but now you're describing that, and now you have to define what free means. Do I have the free will to fly through the air like Superman? Well, don't I want that? Wouldn't I like to fly through the air like Superman? You try. <laughs> so, so, so the idea is that we have freedom, but it's limited by our own, our own capacity. Now, we talked about in previous Sunday schools, we talked about the, the, uh, the grace of God, which is known as, it's, a, it's the grace, the common grace of God, which restrains the evil of man. God is actively restraining the evil of man every second of every day. It is when, man, when God lifts his hand of restraint on peoples in the world, he might lift his hand of restraint on one country and another country or on certain individuals who, who become serial killers and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and when God does that, you see man become the ugliest version of himself. Hitler, for example, was an example of God removing his hand of restraint, his grace of restraint over him. So that, now that's just common grace or people dying of, of uh, certain illnesses that we now have uh, vaccines for. Well, that vaccine that allows a, a someone who would have died as a baby now can live up to the age of 85 or maybe older, that's common grace. So those are good things that have happened in the world. But now we're talking about salvation. Now that's another dimension where we talk about the freedom. Do we have the freedom to choose God. Well, the whole point is, if you look at Romans chapter 3, Paul says, no one seeks for God. So when you look at passages where, Paul, where, where we're told in the New Testament, whoever, Paul says that whoever seeks for him or feels for him will find him. Well, how can anyone seek or feel for God and find him if Paul said, no one seeks after God? Jesus answers that question. He said, no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. You have a comment? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think uh, John Calvin answers uh, Christine's uh, question very well on his commentary of Isaiah 10.15. He says, We must not suppose that there's a violent compulsion as if God dragged them against their will but in a wonderful and inconceivable manner, he regulates all the movements of men so that they still have the exercise of their will. That's pretty, you know, I mean, that hits it on the head. Yes, because see, anytime we do something that's evil, that's us. And of course, there's also the world, there's also Satan. So there's a, there's a three-tiered aspect of it. But in and of ourselves, we are evil. Anything good that we do is actually God's grace. That's why Paul, I'm sorry, James says that every good thing, every good gift that comes from God, the Father of lights. So anytime you do something good, it's not because you're a good person. It's because God was gracious upon you. If you're a good father, that means that God was gracious upon you and your children. If you're a good son, that means you were great, God was gracious on you and your parents to give it. But, but, but God can lift that hand of restraint and the rebellion just begins to grow. That's, why, that's where we see the sovereignty of God, which we'll be covering next time. Uh, so let me. And we can exercise our will for good 
or we can exercise our will for evil and sin. If if the Holy Spirit uh, if the Holy Spirit moves in us, we can, we are then able. In other words, if you do something that is good, it is because the Holy Spirit moved in you. As a matter of fact, in Philippians 2, what Paul says, he says, it is the, it, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to do the good pleasure. So it's God all the way. Okay, uh, Second Chronicles 20, verse 6. And he said, O Yahweh, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens, and are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hands so that no one can take the stand against you. Psalm 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His discernment is infinite. Isaiah 14, 27. For Yahweh of hosts has counseled and who can thwart it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? Isaiah 43, 13. Even from eternity, I am he and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act and who can reverse it? Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord, Yahweh, behold, you have made the heavens and earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Daniel 4, 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can strike against his hand or say to him, what have you done? Mark 10, 27. Looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Ephesians 1, 19 through 20. And when in the surpassing greatness of his power toward us, who believe according to the working of the might of his strength, which he worked in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Revelation 19, 6. Then I heard something like the voice of a great crowd and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. And this is during the Great Tribulation. It's saying, even though all of the chaos is going on in this scene in Revelation 19, it says that the Almighty is reigning in the present tense. So we must remember that no matter what happens in the world, both good and bad, God reigns. So uh, let us pray. Father God, let us submit to you and to know that your will is good even when we don't like it. Let us see that you are all powerful and that everything that you do has a purpose. We ask you for your, for, for your forgiveness for all of the sins that we commit. And we ask you to give us a, a, a deeper understanding of who you are and why you do the things that you do. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, amen.